They had some storms down there. They did, but I wasn't there. I would like to call the City Council mm -hmm. meeting for January the 5th, 2016 to order. Lisa, would you please call the roll? Yes. Schottmeyer? Here. Latour? Present. Long? Gray? Here. Marsh? Here. <laughs> Kenya? Petty? Here. Tennant? Mayor Jordan? Here. Would you join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Well, good evening, everyone. First order of business we have tonight are the mayor's announcements, proclamation, recognition, city council meeting presentations, reports, and discussion items. First item we have tonight is the election of the vice mayor. I will open that up for the floor for nominations. Yes, Matthew. Yeah, I'd like to nominate Sarah Marsh. Is there any other nominations? Okay, I will close the floor to nominations. Uh, when you call the roll, everyone just would say the name. Okay, very good. Would say the name. Yes. The name of our nominee. Yes. Or if we have one. If you have one, or. Okay. So we we'll just close the floor to nominations. Okay. Mm -hmm. Did we just close it? That's not what our rules of procedure says. Our rules of procedure say okay. that upon the vote, the vote will be right. everyone will say the name of the person that they support. Oh, so it just goes like that. That's what our rules of procedure say. So we don't have to open it up for nominations then. No, we just but we do need a vote. Okay, very good. All right, very well. All right, Lisa, would you please call the roll? So are we voting? Uh, this so is, on this vote, I'll just say who I want to be vice mayor. That is correct. All right. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good then. All right. Lisa, would you please call the roll? Schottmeyer. Uh, Sarah Marsh. Luther. Justin Tennant. Gray. Marsh. <coughs> Marsh. Marsh. Petty. Alderman Marsh. Okay. Miss Marsh has been elected. All right. Congratulations. Thank you. All right. Number two is the Fireman's Police and Pension Report that I give every year. And so, in keeping with the statutory requirements, I'm presenting this report for 2015 on the local police and fire retirement and relief funds for the city of Pedal. Both of these plans were closed by law in 1983, and there are no longer any active working members remaining. There are currently 42 police and 50 fire retirees and beneficiaries in the system. At December 2015, projected expenses from the fire pension fund were approximately 1.4 million as compared to fund revenues of 1.2 million. Projected police pension fund expenses were approximately 1.6 million as compared to fund revenues in excess of 1.3 million. This is before adjusting investments to market value. However, on a cash flow basis, contributions are not covering expenses. Actuarial evaluations are the responsibility of the State of Arkansas Fire and Police Pension Review Board. The last evaluations completed were as of May 2015 for the year ending December 31, 2014. Based on those evaluations, the total liability of the police and fire funds were $19.7 million and $18.3 million, respectively, and have grown considerably from prior years. The unfunded actuarially accrued liabilities for these funds were approximately $13 million for police and $14.3 million for fire. In the annual reports issued by the Arkansas Pension Review Board, neither the fire nor police pension fund were found to be actuarially found sound pursuant to established financial tests. The fire pension fund has been classified as projected insolvent since 2009. The fire pension board has been discussing the unstable condition of the fund and possible alternatives since that time, but only recently brought forward a resolution to the City Council requesting the City agree to consolidate with Lofty. On October 2015, Lofty representatives came to Federal to discuss 
the condition of and possible solutions to resolve the fire pension fund financial situation. As you are aware, these presentations were made at special council meetings. However, the issue is complex and solutions discussed all had possible negative consequences to the city. The city attorney also advised the council that consolidation might be unconstitutional under state law. The council administration agreed to further study and discuss the issue again in the spring of 2016. The financial conditions of the fire and police fund have been relatively the same since those meetings, so no change has occurred to make the situation better or worse. However, the asset value of the fund continues to be under $5 million, which makes it subject to further investment restrictions. These restrictions no longer allow investments in individual securities. Investments will be limited to cash, cash equivalents, government bonds, and no-load mutual funds. This means overall returns in the future are likely to be less than previously experienced, which could bring about depletion of the fund earlier than expected. The police pension fund is also considered actuarially unsound, but not in immediate danger of becoming insolvent. The police pension board is also aware of the police pension fund status and has been considering options that would guarantee long-term solvency. I will continue to monitor these pension funds in the future and keep you apprised of any new developments if necessary. Okay. That's it. That's what we have. I think you all are pretty aware of the situation we have with pension funds. And as we have meetings later on in the spring, I will keep you apprised of what we've got going on there. Okay. Right now, I've just got to figure out what we need to do. I think they do, too. Okay. Number three, we have the Federal Housing Authority appointment. Yes, the Fayetteville Housing Authority Board uh, has nominated Mike Emery for re-election to serve an additional five-year term. Uh, the nominating committee did meet and interview Mr. Emery and uh, agreed with their, with their appointment. Uh, his new term will expire on December 28th of 2020 if approved by the council. Okay. Do we need a motion? We need a motion and second. I move we uh, approve Mike Emery's appointment to the Fayetteville Housing Authority Board. Second. 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 All right. Lisa, would you please call the roll? Schottmeyer? Yes. Latour? No. Gray? Yes. Marsh? Yes. Petty? Yes. Tennant? Yes. Okay. Good enough. All right. Next is the consent agenda. All right. Number one, a resolution to approve the purchase of a non-motor pool replacement vehicle from Vail Chevrolet in the amount of $37,242 with options pursuant to a state procurement contract for use by the police department. Number two, a resolution to approve an amendment to the jail services interlocal agreement with the Washington County Arkansas continuing fees at $60 per booked prisoner for 2016. Number three, a resolution authorized acceptance of an Arkansas FireWise grant from the Arkansas Forestry Commission in the amount of $500 for use by the fire department and to approve a budget adjustment. Number four, a resolution to approve a budget adjustment in the amount of $1,000 representing donation revenue from the Bank of Federal to the Federal Fire Department for the annual Employee Service Awards Banquet. Number five, a resolution authorized an application for a 9010 assistance to firefighters grant from the Federal Emergency Management Agency in the amount of $675,000 for the purchase of a mobile live fire training simulator for the fire department. Number six, a resolution award bid number 16 01 to authorize the purchase of reflectorized paint markings from Asphalt Striping Service LLC in variable amounts and for varying unit prices as needed through the end of 2016 for the use by the Transportation Services Department. Number seven, a resolution to award bid number 16-02 and to authorize the purchase of curb and gutter construction from Falkman Enterprises Incorporated in a, as a primary supplier and Thompson Asphalt as secondary supplier. In variable amounts and for varying unit prices as needed through the end of 2016. Number eight, a resolution award bid number 16-04 and authorize the purchase of truck hauling services from S&R Trucking 
for variable unit prices and to authorize the use of other bidders based on price and availability as needed through the end of 2016. Number nine, a resolution to award bid number 16-05 and authorize the purchase of concrete from Toon Concrete Company as primary supplier and GCC Ready Mix as secondary supplier in variable amounts and to authorize the use of other bidders based on price and availability as needed through the end of 2016. Number 10, a resolution to award bid number 16-06 and authorize the purchase of aggregate materials for varying unit prices from various vendors as needed through the end of 2016. Number 11, a resolution to award bid number 16-08 and authorize the purchase of hillside gravel from Les Rogers Incorporated in variable amounts and for varying unit prices as needed through the end of 2016. Number 12, a resolution award bid number 16-09 and to authorize the purchase of plastic drainage pipe for varying unit prices from various vendors as needed through the end of 2016. Number 13, a resolution to award bid number 16-10 and to authorize the purchase of concrete drainage pipe from Surlock Industries as primary supplier and Fatera pipe and precast as secondary supplier in variable amounts and for varying unit prices as needed through the end of 2016. Number 14, a resolution to award bid number 16-11 to authorize the purchase of topsoil from Les Rogers Incorporated. Any amount of $12.40 per cubic yard delivered and $8.50 per cubic yard picked up, in, picked up in variable amounts and needed through the end of 2016. Number 15, a resolution to award bid number 16-12 to authorize the purchase of free form thermal plastic pavement markings from Flint Trading Incorporated in variable amounts and for varying unit prices needed through the end of 2016. Number 16, a resolution to award bid number 16-13 that authorized the purchase of retaining wall blocks from Arrowhead Precast LLC as primary supplier and Industrial Precast Incorporated as secondary supplier in variable amounts and for varying unit prices as needed through the end of 2016. Number 17, a resolution to award bid number 16-14 and authorize the purchase of cold asphalt concrete from APAC Central in variable amounts for a unit price of $95 per ton is needed <coughs> through the end of 2016. <coughs> number 18, a resolution to award bid number 16-15 and authorize the purchase of waste disposal services for construction debris from SNR Trucking Winslow LLC and Holtz Claw Excavating Incorporated in the amount of $10 per load <clears throat> as needed through the end of 2016. Number 19, a resolution to approve the purchase of two Chevrolet Tahoe 4x4 special service vehicles from Superior Automotive Group of Siloam Springs in a total amount of $72,264 pursuant to a state procurement contract for use by the fire department. Number 20, a resolution to approve the purchase of three police package Chevrolet Tahoes from Superior Automotive Group of Siloam Springs in the total amount of $99,867 pursuant to a state procurement contract for use by the police department and to approve a budget adjustment. Number 21, a resolution to approve the purchase of three police package Chevrolet Tahoes from Superior Automotive Group of Siloam Springs in the total amount of $99,867 pursuant to a state procurement contract for use by the police department. Number 22, a resolution to approve the purchase of a 2016 Chevrolet Traverse from Superior Automotive Group of Siloam Springs in the amount of $23,329.85 pursuant to a state procurement contract for use by the police department. Number 23, a resolution to approve the purchase of a Volvo MC135C skid steer from Hug and Hall Equipment of Springdale in the amount of $47,221 pursuant to a Houston Galveston Area Council Cooperative Purchasing Contract used by the West Side Wastewater Treatment Facility. Number 24, a resolution to approve a one-year contract with automatic renewals for four additional one-year terms with the Bicycle Coalition of the Ozarks for Bicycle Programs Coordinator Services at an hourly rate of $16.67. Number 25, a resolution to approve budget adjustment in the amount of $8,914,867 to appropriate proceeds from the 2015 sales and use tax bonds for street projects. And number 26, a resolution to allow the city attorney, as all other city employees, to have attained their 
ta top salary range to receive a one-time service award. I move we accept the consent agenda as read. Second. I have a motion and a second to accept the consent <laughs> agenda as read. Lisa, would you please call the roll? Schottmeyer? Yes. Latour? <laughs> no. Gray? Yes. Marsh? Yes. Hetty? Yes. Tenet? Yes. Okay, thank you all. Under unfinished business, number one, an ordinance to rezone that property described in zoning petition RZN 15-194 for approximately 53.03 acres located at east of Riverwalk Subdivision on Dead Horse Mountain Road from RPZD 06-2170 Villas at Stonebridge to RA Residential Agricultural. I will entertain a motion to go to the second reading. So moved. Second. second. A motion and a second to go to the second reading. <coughs> Lisa, would you please call the roll? Schottmeyer? Yes. Latour? Yes. Gray? Yes. Marsh? Yes. Petty? Yes. Tenet? Yes. In order to rezone that property described in rezoning petition RZN 15-5194 for approximately 53.03 acres located at the east of Riverwalk subdivision on Dead Horse Mountain Road from RPZD 6-2170 Villas at Stonebridge to RA Residential Agricultural. Chair. Sure. Um, you may remember at the last council meeting, uh, several rezoning items came through uh, before you for uh, expired plan zoning districts. Um, all of those except this one were approved. Uh, so this is our last expired plan zoning district that we're aware of in the city. Um, this particular project is called the Villas at Stonebridge. It contained about 50 acres uh, on the southeast side of town off of Dead Horse Mountain Road. Um, the the um, original project consisted of uh, single-family and multi-family dwellings uh, in, within a planned zoning district, so there's open space, um, and community services as well. Um, staff is recommending the project or the property return back to its original zoning of residential agricultural. Uh, the Planning Commission also voted six to one in favor of that request. Uh, we felt that RA was a, a more appropriate zone for this particular area, being located on the outskirts of the city in a predominantly rural area. Um, suburban densities we felt would be out of character generally with the undeveloped nature of most of the surrounding land and our city plan 2030 future land use plan designates this site as a rural residential area um, the applicant is present tonight um, and I believe it has also offered a bill of assurance that was emailed out to you earlier uh, yesterday and I'd like uh, Mr. Rhodes to be able to present that item sure. Robert <laughs> Good evening, Mayor, Council, the rest of the folks. May I introduce uh, Mitchell Massey. He is the owner of the property, and um, he has also brought someone who I've just met today, his very astute business partner, <laughs> Matt. <laughs> um, Kid, I think I'm going to need some help procedurally because I, um, I, I, what I think we would like to do is we would ask that, I guess, a motion be made that um, our request to turn this into an RSF4, because I think right now what's I think before the council is to rezone it to um, RA, uh, pursuant to the planning department's. Um, I think eventually uh, the city council should uh, uh, have an opportunity to amend it uh, to RSF4 with subject to the bill of assurance. Uh, I would suggest really that that probably be done at the at the next meeting. We only have six aldermen here, as you're well aware. It takes five affirmative votes to get this rezoned. I certainly want it rezoned something because right now it's zoned to an expired PZD, which means there are no development rights on this property. And so at the very least, it should be zoned RA. But I think that the applicant should have an opportunity to request uh, an amendment to RSF 4 subject to his bill of assurance with the city council's approval I will have prepared such an ordinance for the next meeting so that it can you can get an up and down vote at that point in time about whether or not you wish to rezone it as the applicant requests or as the planning department has suggested I don't think we need to do the amendment tonight I think probably ought to have the full council here when that is done because that's going to be probably the biggest issue to be decided, and uh, that will require five votes. So I would think that uh, you could present whatever you want to tonight, and I, you can discuss, obviously, your bill of assurance that has been sent to the clerk and myself and furnished to the city council. 
but I think the actual formal amendment might be done better at the second meeting in January when you have, hopefully, the full council will be here then. I, I'm not sure, but hopefully we'll have everybody here for that because, as I said, to make the final decision, it will require five affirmative <laughs> votes one way or the other. If I, if I may ask, I'm, I mean, I, after I give uh, some of the comments that, uh, that would, I think, bode well for the rezoning that we're asking for, I see there's six aldermen, alder persons here, and perhaps five might want to vote tonight. Um, that is a possibility if things turn that, turned out that way, is it not, Mr. Williams? Yes, it, that's certainly correct. If, if you, uh, uh, you're the applicant or the, uh, actually the applicant, I guess, is uh, Jeremy Pate with the city, but you certainly, as a representative of the property owner, have every right to request an amendment. Okay, Justin, you had a question. Um, actually, it's for Kit. So there, if we do that, that doesn't change. There's no public notification, no anything that changes any time frames other than just putting it on the agenda and the public can see it then and things like that. Yeah, that, that is correct. Uh, we have in the past, in fact, changed uh, a zoning, a city council, I should say, has in the fact uh, changed the zoning request at a council meeting. Mm -hmm. Uh, the public was notified prior to the initial uh, request by the city as the applicant before it went to the Planning Commission. Right. As long as it continues forward, then that notice continues, and so there's not a re-notification requirement. And I'll ask Jeremy, is that, is that not what we've done in the past, Jeremy? That's correct. So there's no reset. That was just my question. That, I'm fine with that. I just want to make sure. <clears throat> Thank you. So if it's if if the amendment is for RSF four and that passes, then it goes from RA to RSF four, or is that something that just gets? No, the amend. Well, initially, if, to get it to the RSF four ordinance, we would need a motion to amend the ordinance that's before the city council to RSF four, subject to a bill of assurance instead of the RA. And then you would vote it up or down. The amendment, yeah, the first would be the amendment, and at that point then, if it is amended, right. then that would be the ordinance before the city council. All right. And then you'd vote that up or down? Yes. Okie doke. <clears throat> All right. Yes, Rob. Thank you for that explanation. Um, uh, I'd like to remind you that this was a PZD at 6.6 .6 units per acre. And as you can tell now, it's, uh, we've reduced that quite a bit to the RSF-4, and um, the, uh, with the Bill of Assurance, it takes it down even, even a good bit more. I would also remind you that the prior owners that, that my client purchased the property from were part of the coalition that paid for the, um, the, the improvements, the structural improvements that went under the river. And that, uh, you know, that, and I guess I've, the reason I bring that up is I sort of look at this piece of property and, and in my opinion, that ought to give this piece of property, in, at least in your mind, a little bit of entitlement that, that um, it, it, the, the prior owners put good money that the citizens of Fayetteville are now enjoying. Um, I'd, also, I'd also ask you to look, and I don't know if these have been sent to you, but I brought some copies and, and we can hand them out real quick here. But I've got two maps, and it'll give you a good idea of this property. I think I've got enough. And the reason I bring, I bring these maps and ask you to look at them is it's, it sort of gives you a good feel for this piece of property, which, as you can see, is in light blue, and it's called the site right in the middle of both of these maps. If you note, there is a good bit, a lot of RSF4, if you look at the first one, all around this property. And then what isn't RSF4? is golf course, and if you look at the second map, it's all flood zone, okay? And so with that in mind, I think, I think that this, 
this council, you know, I think can look at this and say, well, um, it doesn't necessarily need to have, it doesn't have to be RA. There is um, a, a lot of property, so you're, you're still being, you know, uh, still you know, holding true to what the, the rest of the property around it is. And then if you, um, if you kind of remember back, I think, um, I think Alderman at the last meeting, I think Alderman Kenyon, he was either at the last meeting or maybe it was at a, at a um, agenda session uh, when Alderman Latour said, well, 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 can't we just make this RSF-4 like the, like the applicant's asking and do that now? And Mr. Kenyon said, well, if they would bring a plan. And so that caused the applicant to bring forth the, uh, the bill of assurance, and I dare say that's a plan. It goes from um, what was asked for initially and what was granted in the PZD, that has expired, I understand that, um, and it takes it to 2.5. Also, if you, if you um, take into consideration that anybody that builds in Fayetteville, if they build pursuant to a zoning designation that we're asking for, and they build pursuant to, um, uh, to a bill of assurance, uh, they not only have to follow that, but they also have to follow the ordinances and the regulations and the rules of this city, of the county, and of the, of the state as far as drainage regulations and what have you. And so, uh, no, the applicant doesn't have a specific plan um, as far as what they plan on building exactly, but I think at this stage, um, what you consider when you're trying to determine whether you ought to be rezoning this, you know, is, um, will this be compatible with the surrounding land? And I dare say that I think it will be. Um, I would also ask you further to, to keep in mind that you know, if you look at your guiding principles um, and, and compare you know, the, if you, the, the guiding principles that talk about rural agricultural talks about um, historically agricultural. Well, I don't think this property has been historically agricultural for quite some time. Um, it, is, it has been part of a golf course, or it, I'm sorry, it's been adjacent to a golf course, and the people that originally built the golf course, originally Dash Goff and the other folks, they had envisioned that this piece of property this site, this 53 acres, would be part of a residential development. And so historically, not for the last 20 years has this been agriculture. Um, another guiding principle for RA says foster compatibility um, in the surrounding rural area. Well, the golf course is going to stay the golf course, and the surrounding area, as you can see by these maps, isn't necessarily rural. It is a lot of RA and a lot of, uh, a lot of other uses around it. Um, also, the reason to have RA, one of the guiding principles, is local food production. Again, this has not been used for food production. I don't know when it's been used for food production. Perhaps many, 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 many years ago, someone raised cattle on it or something of that nature. But again, not for the last 20 years or so. And the last thing is to protect agriculture such as or, um, orchards, berry farms, etc. It hasn't been a berry farm or an orchard. I bring all that up to say that this council has the authority to, and, 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 and not, I'm not asking you to disregard these guiding principles, I'm just asking you to kind of think about them and realize that the request for an RSF-4 you wouldn't be violating the guiding principles. I think you can easily take, uh, you know, take that vote and, um, and especially with the Bill of Assurance at 2.5. Um, I'd also tell you that the uh, property already has water and sewer right to it and, and it's, it's ready to develop. I'd entertain any questions or I'd come back if you want me to. What questions do we have, Mr. Rhodes, on this? Yes, John. So, Mr. Rhodes, you'd like to have an up or down vote on your proposal tonight? Well, even though two of our members are missing and you might have better odds two weeks from now? 
Well, I don't know about odds. Um, <laughs> I mean, I look around and and I you know I see there's there's six people. I mean, I'm guessing I'm betting I'll get six votes <laughs> in some form or fashion. That's good odds. You'll get six votes, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, we don't know what they're going to be though. <laughs> I, I guess I'd like. A, I think I have the option to ask for that vote, and if you don't mind, I'd kind of like to hear some discussion amongst the council members, sure and I'd also like to hear if anyone from the public um, is going to speak up, but uh, I'd kind of like to keep the option in the back of my pocket tonight, um, and, but I'll let you know pretty soon. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, I support the applicant's application, and I think bringing this back to rural agriculture food production is counter productive to our city. I think development is a good thing. I think we have plenty of regulations in place to make sure that development takes place in an orderly fashion that will comply with state law and local law, and we have a lot of them. Uh, so I'm not worried about uh, unrestrained or un, uh, just abated construction uh, like we're so afraid of here. So I support the applicant's application and his zoning preference. I think the applicant himself or herself in Maggie's case are in the best position to determine what should be done with the property. Uh, I've repeated ad nauseum. The applicant is the one that has the funds at risk. The applicant is the one who defends the lawsuits. The applicant is the one who pays the taxes. The applicant has the most to lose if the applicant guesses badly. We sit here in our sterile governmental capacity and try to second guess the market. I would much prefer to see the applicant make this decision instead of us. But he has my vote and I'd encourage my colleagues to grant the applicant what he needs to develop this property. Anybody? Yes, Matthew. I just have a couple of questions. I'm not really too concerned with the request other than it might set an unusual precedent. Um, and the reason I bring that up is because typically, you know, these administrative items, we just wave them through uh, when we're talking about um, restoring development rights to expired PZDs. I'm not sure we've ever um, actually amended one. And, you know, normally rezoning requests from applicants have to go through a usual process of staff issuing some findings and the Planning Commission considering it. And so I'm wondering, was, it, was this request presented to the Planning Commission? Yes, it was. And was there any motion? Did they consider it? or they just That's why the Planning to? Commission divided it. I think the, my recollection is the Planning Commission, Commission kicked ours off separate from the other uh, uh, expired PCDs. That's correct. So this was the only one out of those seven or eight that were in, was in contention. So the Planning Commission actually um, ended up pulling this one out separately and voting on it separately um, as part of their application and recommendation to you all. So the recommendation was still to go to RA? That's correct. It's a six to one vote, I believe. Um, was there a, a, an affirmative motion or anything like that to make it RSF4? I don't believe so. The, um, let's see if that's in here. I think the application was simply, um, they discussed the RSF4 at the meeting, heard public comment, um, and ended up voting to, to recommend to RA. Uh, and what do you think of their, uh, what was their principal reason for doing so? Is it a concern with density or something else? I believe so. I think there was also a concern um, uh, from at least one neighbor present who's also here tonight. Um, there's also many times in discussion in this area, as we all saw with the recent flooding, access issues to this area uh, where the roads are closed uh, for sometimes significant amount of time. So that's obviously a concern. Um, the biggest change between what Mr. Rhodes referred to is a plan zoning district approved at 16 units per acre and now is we have an entirely different land use plan um, before when that plan zoning district was approved and now it was shown as a residential area to be developed at that time. Uh, now it's shown as more rural uh, residential, um, so a larger lot or, or maintaining it in its open space until such time as there is adequate infrastructure to support the area. Does the offered bill of assurance change your uh, determination at all? Okay, well then I, I have one more question. Um, we just saw the Bill of Assurance recently. I'm wondering, um, Kid, if you had time to review it, if you think it's enforceable? <coughs> yes, I do think it's enforceable. It, it appears to be uh, from the form I have left with the planning department to be used. And so I think it has all the proper requirements to be enforceable. Okay, thanks. <coughs> okay. 
Anything else? Yes, John. So from from I mean from Matthew and Jeremy's discussion, I'm I'm getting the idea that the planning commission thinks it's best left as a cow pasture. And you know, I don't know how many millions of dollars or hundreds of thousands of dollars the owner has invested in this property, but uh, to say it has to be left as a cow pasture seems awfully restrictive. Uh, surely we could agree that they can do something more than just have a agricultural field or pasture. That, uh, I mean, yes, I mean, streets do flood when it rains. I mean, that's part of living. That's part of urban living. We live in a city. If you don't want that, move to Madison County. If you don't like traffic, move to Madison County. We're going to have traffic. We're going to have flooding because we have rooftops. We have water runoffs. Uh, that's part of it when it rains heavily. Uh, so I hope that we wouldn't divest the owner of his ability to develop property based on those reasons. I mean, there's livelihood, there's a family at stake here. <coughs> let's not betray their trust in us as a city and let's give them the ability to develop their property in one way or another. Not surely we can do better than a cow pasture. <laughs> Okay. Sarah, did you? I'd like to hear if there is any public comment before I... Okay, I think Justin has a question. Well, it's not really a question. It's just a comment. I agree with, with John in, in uh, uh, what he says about the, the flooding piece. I mean, if you move out there, you know what you're going to have and what you're not going to have. Uh, and with the Bill of Assurance, uh, I'm not concerned, really, with this property at all. Going out there uh, several times, like I have, at 2.5 an acre, that for Fayetteville, that's... Uh, that's a pretty good sized piece of land. We're not we're not putting a house right next to another house uh, in this situation, and uh, so I would I would be in support of this. Okay. What public comment do we have? Mayor. Oh, I'm sorry, Adela. Yes, I, that's okay. <laughs> sorry, I just Adela. wanted to say that um, I you <clears throat> shocked me. I uh, uh, have not had any negative, not one negative phone call or email about this proposal, unlike many of the, the others that have come before us in Ward 1. So I, uh, <clears throat> I, I take that to be a very positive move, and I will be supporting this. <laughs> okay. Go ahead, Marilyn. I apologize. <laughs> I'm Marilyn Hefner, and I own the property that's adjacent to this, and I'm the one at the Planning Commission that spoke against it. I think that the the PZD at 6.6 .6 was way too dense for that, and probably I was asleep at the wheel when that came through, or I would have spoken for it. I do not have a problem with the Bill of Assurance at 2.5, and I would welcome that, and I appreciate your vote for my neighbor. Okay. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Mary. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, I'll bring it back to the council. Mayor. Mayor. I'm sorry. Yes, Sarah. Yes. My concern on this is the same concern I had on the other Stonebridge properties, and that's the river. Um, we have um, a watershed that is at danger of impairment. We have a lot of sedimentation that's coming into this watershed that we are tasked with removing. Um, and it, that can be a very expensive venture. And so, you know, what seems like a simple rezoning is really not when you look, zoom out and look at the watershed issues and how the runoff from this will impact uh, the West Fork of the White River. Um, and 2.5 units an acre, essentially what we're building there is sprawl. And if you look at our 2030 city plan goals, number two is that we will discourage suburban sprawl. Um, and, you know, in looking at this plan, you know, while residential agriculture may not seem like uh, the most appropriate zoning because this isn't necessarily an agricultural piece of land, um, it is not a place to be building new neighborhoods. Um, so I will not support rezoning it to um, RSF4 with the Bill of Assurance. Um, although, you know, if the applicant were to look at some neighborhood conservation or a small cluster of development, I think that there is some room to work there to allow them to recoup some of their investment, but the, I think that the proposal on the table is not appropriate for this parcel. Okay. 
Question. Yes. Jeremy, could you remind us um, the, allow, the allowable <laughs> density in RA? Sure. Um, residential agricultural, I think a lot of people just think it's only agricultural. It actually allows uh, several residential uses as well. Um, and the density is one unit per two acres. Um, for residential agricultural, it includes, of course, agricultural animal husbandry, single family and two family dwellings, accessory dwellings, animal boarding and training. So all those are permitted uses by right. Hmm. Uh, if I'm to read that right, the delta between RA and the proposal is um, RA would allow about uh, 26 units, and the proposal would bump that up by 100. Correct. I think the proposal before you would allow 133 units on the on the property. Yeah, uh, John had one then, sir. Mayor, I don't think I'm going to change Alderwoman's mi Alderwoman Marsh's mind, but I'd point out that we do have a stream site protection ordinance in the city, and that I think offers adequate protection for the White River, and I don't think that should be used as a reason to deny the applicant their desired zoning. Okay. <coughs> sure. Um, well, perhaps, well, actually, um, Alderman um, Latour was not present at the water and sewer meeting where we discussed the implications of uh, sediment in the White River and the potential multi-million dollar cost to this municipality that we could incur if we don't curb that. But um, I think that you know the difference between 133 units and 26 units is significant. And one of the reasons we may not have heard from more neighbors um, on this is due to the holidays. You know, that was the last meeting of the year. This is the first meeting of the year. So I would like to see this held on, uh, I guess we're on the second reading now, um, and to give the, uh, the other neighbors an opportunity to become aware of what's going on and weigh in, as well as to give our other aldermen a chance to weigh in. Anybody else? I'm ready to vote for it. I mean, as, as it's presented to us. Okay. <coughs> Robert? Um, we do believe we'd like to ask for a vote. Okay. So. It's on second reading right now. Well, the first vote ought to be uh, to, amend to amend to an R for <coughs> RSF 4. And even though I haven't drafted it, I could read what it would be if you want me to. Go ahead. It would be an ordinance to rezone that property described in rezoning petition RZN 15-5194 for approximately 53 acres located at the east of Riverwork Subdivision on Dead Horse Mountain Road from RPZD 06-2170 Villas at Stonebridge to RSF 4 subject to the submitted Bill of Assurance. Now, so we, need, yeah, we need an amendment to that. If it does not get amended, then it, if it, it would come back in two weeks then. Well, at, at this point, if it wouldn't get amended, uh, or if it does get amended, it, would it have to be a suspension of the rules to go third and final reading if they wanted to be a vote tonight? Otherwise, it would be two weeks before either one would be subject to final approval. I guess my question is, if the rezoning amendment fails tonight, it could be resubmitted in two weeks with full council here, though, could it not? That's right. Unless the rules are suspended by a two-thirds vote, there will not be a final vote tonight. Okay. Okay. Mr. Mayor, I move that we amend the proposal before us to do exactly what Mr. Rhodes would like to do, move this to an RSF4 zoning classification. I would second that. Okay. We have a motion to second to amend it to an RSF4. What discussion do we have on the amendment? Anything? All right. Any public comment on the amendment? Bring it back to the council. Any final comments on this? Okay. Please switch call the roll. Schottmeyer? Yes. Latour? Yes. Gray? Yes. Marsh? No. <coughs> Petty? No. Tennant? Yes. 
Yeah, that is four votes, and to amend an ordinance, like passing an ordinance, requires five affirmative votes. So, Mayor, you may vote if you please to. I'm not going to vote. Okay, then the amendment has failed, and we still have the original uh, ordinance before you. Now, I would recommend to the council, as the city attorney did, we hold this for two weeks and let the full council weigh in on this. Or not. We don't hear a motion to suspend the rules, and we'll need to move on to the next item. Okay. Let's move on to the next item. <clears throat> New business. Number one, an ordinance waived the requirements of formal competitive bidding during calendar year 2016. Hang on. Yes. For the purchase of asphalt materials for use by the Transportation Division, but to require informal quarterly bids or quotes. Kit. Whereas the crude oil market continues to experience price volatility, and whereas the volatility makes normal competitive bidding procedures unworkable, impractical, and not feasible, and whereas the Transportation Division proposes to solicit and accept bids on a quarterly basis without the need for further approval of the City Council through calendar year 2016. Now, therefore, it be ordained by the City Council of the City of Fayetteville, Arkansas, Section 1, that the City Council of the City of Fayetteville, Arkansas, hereby finds that such circumstances constitute an exceptional situation where annual competitive bidding is not feasible or practical, and therefore, through calendar year 2016, waives requirements of formal competitive bidding for the purchase of asphalt materials and authorizes the Transportation Division to solicit informal bids or quotes on a quarterly basis without the need for further approval by the City Council. Terry. Uh, yes, Mayor Council, this, this is an item that we started several years ago when the volatility of the oil prices was uh, the companies would not guarantee their bid for the course of the entire year. So we came up with this through purchasing to bring this forward on a quarterly basis. We actually bid it more often rather than less. It also has the possibility of prices like they have been going down, giving us a better price quarterly rather than just, uh, but it also protects the uh, companies that are bidding to if the oil prices go up, it allows them to uh, not be bought into a bid that they have to honor for the entire year. This has worked real well in the past. It gives us, uh, I think, the most flexibility we could have with this situation and we and we done this for several years and it's worked out well so we're just asking for a bid waiver to approve that. Any more questions we have in the council on this? All right. Any public comment on this? Okay, we'll bring it back to the council. Move to spin the rules go to second reading. Second. We have a motion and a second to go to the second reading. Lisa, would you please call the roll? Schottmeyer? Yes. Mature? Yes. Gray? Yes. Marsh? Yes. Hetty? Yes. Tenant? Yes. An ordinance to weigh the requirements of formal competitive bidding during calendar year 2016 for the purchase of asphalt materials for use by the Transportation Division, but to require informal quarterly bids or quotes. We have, to go to the third. Third we have a motion and a second to go to the third and final reading. Lisa, would you please call the roll? Schottmeyer? Yes. Latour? Yes. Gray? Yes. Marsh? Yes. Hetty? Yes. Tenant? Yes. In order to weigh the requirements of formal competitive bidding during calendar year 2016 for the purchase of asphalt materials for use by the Transportation Division, but to require informal quarterly bids or quotes. What well, final comments do we have in the council on this? <coughs> Lisa, would you please call the roll? Schottmeyer? Yes. Latour? Yes. Gray? Yes. Marsh? Yes. Eddie? Yes. Tenant? Yes. Okay. Number two, a resolution to amend the Master Street Plan by reclassifying Greg Avenue between Center Street and Meadow Street as an alley. Jeremy? This is a portion of Greg Avenue uh, located at the northeast corner of Center Street and Greg Avenue, um, which is near the trail crossing, Frisco Trail Crossing, um, just west of uh, downtown area. Um, the site is developed with warehouse type buildings that have been converted into a number of commercial spaces. Frisco Trail runs actually on this property on the east side. The applicant uh, granted the city easements for that purpose uh, back when Frisco Trail was constructed uh, several years ago. 
Uh, in 2004, there was a, a project approved um, on this site, which uh, never did occur. And at that time, the city council uh, actually vacated some right of way along Gregg Avenue and also reclassified it as a public alley. Um, in 2005, the following year, we also began implementing many of the recommendations of our downtown master plan. One of those was to reclassify all of the streets um, within the downtown uh, master plan area. Uh, that was completed in August of 2005. That action reclassified this alley back to a street section, uh, which was inadvertent, um, and the applicant has, or the property owner has brought that to our attention. We're simply requesting this to be returned back to an alley um, section. Um, the reasons then and now are still the same. This is a very narrow property. The city did give up, um, or the city did uh, request, and the applicant granted us property for our trail. We believe the um, street section functions much more as an alley than it ever would a street. So we're recommending <coughs> approval of this resolution. What questions about the chairman on this? Yes, John. Chairman, is there any vehicular traffic on this portion of the street right now? I'm sorry. Well, any vehicles drive here? There are. It's very, uh, very low volume uh, street. Meadow Street actually intersects um, near where the trail crosses, but it's very low volume street. So who do you think uses this street now? Residents that live back in this area? It's likely um, the property owner themselves and then anyone uh, potentially um, leasing space out in within the, the Quonset huts that are located on the property. Are there alternative routes they can take when yes, we close this downtown alley? The primary parking area is located off of Center Street, and there's also access from Meadow Street. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Any other questions? <clears throat> Any public comment on this? <laughs> See, now I'm bringing back to the council. I move we pass the resolution. Second. Motion is second to pass the resolution. Any final comments? Lisa, would you please call the roll? Tom Meyer? Yes. Latour? Yes. Gray? Yes. Marsh? Yes. Head? Yes. Tenant? Yes. Okay, number three. A resolution to grant community by design incorporated request to dedicate a lesser right of way of 33 feet instead of the normal 50 feet to place a sidewalk adjacent to the curb without the normal six feet of green space and tree planting area by finding that Otherwise, this development would suffer undue hardship or practical difficulties. Uh, who has that? Jeremy? This application is part of a larger development proposal called Willow Bend, which you all are aware of. Um, it's a little less than eight acres located in the Walker Park neighborhood. Uh, due east of Walker Park, um, it's located south of 7th Street and west of Wood Avenue. The property is currently undeveloped um, and zoned to neighborhood conservation. That's also an item on your um, agenda tonight is to rezone the property. Um, for several years now, it's been planned for an attainable housing project. Um, the city has been in discussion and, and has um, uh, committed, at least informally, to uh, assisting with the development of streets within the area up to a million dollars um, for uh, construction of a street network. Um, Fayetteville Partners for Better Housing is the nonprofit leading this venture. Um, and the city of Fayetteville um, uh, is certainly supportive of the, uh, the attainable housing addition within the city. Um, this particular item is a, a code variant <coughs> request. Um, chapter 166 requires all new streets within a subdivision or neighborhood to be constructed in accordance with the master street plan standards. Um, the <laughs> applicant is proposing new streets as part of their development project, um, and those do not meet the specific standards that we have um, for a local street. Local streets are generally those low volume, um, low speed streets that we have within neighborhoods. Um, those types of streets are being developed here in terms of their um, size and capacity. Um, however, there's a, a bit different um, view on this particular project. Um, one, there's significant tree canopy. The applicants would like to preserve uh, as much as possible within the, within the neighborhood. Uh, and so they're proposing 33 foot rights of way as opposed to 50 foot rights of way. What that does essentially is gets all of the elements of our local street section simply within a smaller um, street cross section. Uh, what you see, what you, you would see is a cross section that's shown uh, within your packet where you would have still um, two travel lanes, parallel parking, uh, sidewalks would be actually adjacent to the curb, much like you see in some of our downtown residential neighborhoods and some of those in Walker Park as well. Uh, and then the green space would actually be on the outside of the um, sidewalks as opposed to between the curb and sidewalk. There have been some questions raised about is that a safer condition or a less safe condition. Because of the slow speed of the traffic and the design of the neighborhood, we believe that um, this will be uh, perfectly fine, just much, again, may, much like our downtown neighborhoods that were developed historically. Uh, so staff um, is uh, supportive of the request, um, and we do believe it meet all our minimum fire code requirements and general traffic safety requirements. 
Okay, what questions do we have from the council on this? Mr. Mayor, I just want to say <clears throat> I want to make sure that uh, the council realize that uh, we are not partners with this development uh, in a legal sense uh, and that they still must meet the requirement that you have placed for them in the code that uh, this lessening of dedication must be in the event of an undue hardship or practical difficulties. Uh, undue hardship is most likely not be able to be met because of costs because otherwise every developer coming through town would say it costs me more to dedicate 50, 50 uh, feet than it does 33 feet. So uh, the practical difficulties are is because of this land is in fact uh, flood prone, mm -hmm. very low land, a lot of the houses I guess are going to be built on stilts or whatever. So because of the flood prone nature of this land then that could be a practical difficulty if you see fit but that's the kind of thing that you would have to look at and not just simply be to save this developer money unless you're going to save every developer money. Okay. Is the applicant here? Would you? Um, John Anderson with Anderson Kim, the development consultants to the applicant. Excuse me. <coughs> I'm always a little choked up to speak to such an august body. Um, the, uh, I would agree with Kit's point that it's not really a question of uh, practical difficulty over cost. It's more a condition of the land as we find it, which is uh, because there's a tremendous amount of stormwater that comes from a, well, the drainage basin is about 50 acres, and it all heads into that eight acre piece and then leaves out of one little ditch by the, by the head start. Um, so, uh, and the city's been quite progressive in their uh, tree preservation ordinance, which has a lot to do with trying to minimize flooding and, and runoff and like, particularly for uh, something that's already got 50 acres worth of water coming onto it. So, uh, looking hard at being able to preserve as many of the mature trees that are on the site to hold water, reduce runoff and the like. Um, the, uh, uh, there's a lot of constraint that comes from that, and I, and I would say that that's probably the principal practical difficulty. So if we're going to manage the tree canopy well, if we're going to manage the connections and the streets and the like, uh, the um, uh, still providing the, the pedestrian circulation that comes from the two sidewalks, still providing the on-street parking, uh, the functional requirements for safety and welfare being met, and I think that this is really a, a practical way to solve a, a condition that you meet on the ground with this piece of ground. Um, my understanding is there's also a similar street section allowed in the hillside section uh, where there's more slope so you have less cut and you have a narrower section <laughs> and you're allowed to put the sidewalk directly in the back of the, of the curb. So it's a, uh, I would feel that it's a similar condition uh, kind of driven by uh, what Mother Nature has left on the ground for us to contend with rather than uh, it's a flat piece of ground and we'd like to skinny up a right away by seven feet. That's not the case at all. So if you have questions, I'd be happy to entertain What questions we have, Ms. Sanders? Anything? All right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, is there any public comment on this? <laughs> okay. Bring back to the council. Yes, Matthew. Um, I'd, I'd like to add that um, I hope we can find a way. Uh, not, I think it might even be better if staff was able to grant these kinds of requests um, administratively, you know, to be able to consider the circumstances and, and do this. Because I suspect there are many sites in the city that um, are subject to similar constraints. Uh, in any case, I move we pass the resolution. Second. Okay, okay. I have a motion and a second to pass the resolution. Any final comments? Okay, I'm sorry, sir. Yes. I just want to say thank you um, to the developers for all your hard work to <coughs> build some affordable housing that meets our 2030 city plan goals. Um, I think this is a really good compromise. Uh, it helps reduce the impervious surface area, which is critical in this flood prone area, and as well as improving the tree preservation. It's great to see um, this kind of development come forward, um, and hopefully we'll also create a safer neighborhood with these narrower street lanes. It'll help people slow down and pay attention and uh, be a beautiful neighborhood. So thank you uh, for support this proposal. Okay. 
Any other final comments from the council? Okay. Lisa, would you please call the roll? Sean Meyer? Yes. Latour? Yes. Gray? Yes. Marsh? Yes. Teddy? Yes. Tennant? Yes. Okay, number four. In order to rezone that property described in rezoning petition RZN 15-5254 for approximately 7.74 acres located north of 1016 South Washington Avenue from NC Neighborhood Conservation to RSF 18, residential single family, 18 units per acre. Kip. Be it ordained by the City Council of the City of Fayetteville, Arkansas, Section 1, that the City Council of the City of Fayetteville, Arkansas hereby changes the zone classification of the property shown on the map, Exhibit A, and the legal description, Exhibit B, both attached to the Planning Department's agenda memo from Neighborhood Conservation to RSF 18, residential single family, 18 units per acre. And Section 2, that the City Council of the City of Fayetteville, Arkansas hereby amends the official zoning map of the City of Fayetteville to reflect the zoning change provided in Section 1. Chairman. You may all recall a few weeks ago, um, the City Council approved a, our newest zoning district option, RSF 18, which is a residential single family, 18 units per acre. Um, it allows for single family uses um, in a more dense fashion, uh, so smaller lots, a more uh, compact development pattern. Um, this is the first request for a rezoning to that zoning uh, district, and um, we're happy to present this same project site uh, the walk, near in, in the Walker Park area for the Willow Bend project. Uh, we believe the request to rezone the project from neighborhood conservation, which is also a single family, uh, to RSF 18 is compatible with surrounding land uses. If you remember the Walker Park uh, neighborhood master plan, there are a number of um, lots already platted within this neighborhood that are quite compact in a more traditional um, development pattern. Um, with some alley loaded, some are not, um, but all around Walker Park and their downtown. Some of our historic neighborhoods are much like uh, what is planned here. Um, we believe it's compatible with the surrounding mix of single family detached residential properties to the north, east, and west. And there's also low density multifamily properties directly to the south of this project. Um, so we believe this is a good transitional area for a higher density single family residential product that will contribute to the housing mix within the neighborhood. Um, that being said, staff and the Planning Commission um, recommending approval of this with a vote of eight to zero. Okay, what well, questions do we have for Jeremy on this? Thing. All right, any public comment on this? I'm uh, Dan Wagner. I'm at 1150 South Washington, so very close to the the southwest uh, corner of the, the development, uh, which I'm in support of. Um, the one thing I would ask, uh, Mayor, that you would consider and the council would consider uh, in this rezoning is the amount of traffic that this is set to add to South Washington Street. Uh, and the reason is, as uh, far as I know, and this may have changed since uh, some of the initial meetings about this development, was that there was going to be one access from Washington to, you know, 75 homes, which, you know, the, the density right now is, you know, there's about uh, 0.17 acres per, per lot down there, and you're talking about going to more than, you know, twice that density with single-family units. Um, so you figure... You know, at least two vehicles per single family unit, typically, maybe three, each making two plus trips a day uh, in and out. So South Washington's already, uh, as many of you may know, fairly narrow, um, receives a fair amount of traffic, even three traffic as people using it as a way to cut from MLK down to 15th Street. Um, it's a very nice grade, uh, the city had redone it. Uh, say 2006 or 7, uh, around the time that I, I moved in there. And so people use it as a nice cut through and get to go in 40, 50 miles an hour down the street. Uh, there's a lot of kids on that live on that street, mine included. Uh, and I would just ask that something that ought to be considered in this is multiple access, uh, points of access in and out of an area that's going to have so many residents uh, to think that you're going to add all that traffic to just Washington Street uh, seems a little bit excessive. But uh, with that said, I, I think this is going to be a good development for this part of town, and uh, I think it's going to be good for uh, mine and everyone else's uh, property values in that area. So. 
Thank you. Thank you. Who else would like to address this? Mayor, members of the council, the, um, our, just so you understand our basic thinking and asking for the rezone on this is that once the, uh, the new zoning category was created, it presented an opportunity to um, basically submit our uh, preliminary plat under a much more straightforward kind of approach. Uh, the current uh, zoning of neighborhood conservation with the conceptual plans we've been working with and trying to sort out issues of the drainage and the tree canopy and the like uh, and how to establish additional access. Uh, as we look at all those things coming up with a preliminary plat, you probably would have uh, either put us in a position to be asking for kind of a bundle of variances which, or probably more likely a, a PCD type application. Um, so the new, uh, the, the rezone would allow us to basically make a, an application as of right with the, uh, the only exception that we would anticipate at this point was the one you guys just voted for, which was the different street section. So we're trying to approach this in a comprehensive way and we want to be mindful of uh, any of the issues of, of, of traffic, for instance. Um, my understanding is that we're going to need to provide at least a second point of access and several uh, stubs to in kind of in all directions so that there are opportunities to connect uh, I believe up to 7th and to Wood Avenue as well. But my understanding is that we're going to have to come up with two points of access uh, just to uh, put a responsible proposal forward on the preliminary plat. Um, the, uh, uh, there's the access issue, there's the this more straightforward approach and basically an as of right under current zoning once we sorted out the, the right of way issue. So that's, that was our intent and our thinking um, and I think that the, uh, we'll certainly, con uh, as that preliminary plat comes forward, we'll be meeting with folks in the neighborhood to make sure that they have good background on it uh, so that all the discussion doesn't have to happen at the dais when, when the action comes forward for the commission. So we thank you for your time. I'll take any questions if you have any. All right. Do I have any questions, Mr. Anderson, on this? Okay. Thank you. Any other public comment? Okay. I'm going to bring back to the council. Move away the rules and go to the second reading. Second. So motion second to go to the second reading. <coughs> Lisa, would you please call the roll? Schottmeyer? Yes. Latour? Yes. Gray? Yes. Marsh? Yes. Petty? Yes. Tennant? Yes. An ordinance to rezone that property described in rezoning petition RZN 15-5254 for approximately seven and three quarter acres located north of 1016 South Washington Avenue from neighborhood conservation to RSF 18 residential single family 18 units per acre. Okay. I move we suspend the rules, go to the third and final second. Second. Okay, motion second, go to the third and final reading. Lisa, would you please call the roll? Schottmeyer? Yes. Latour? Yes. Gray? Yes. Marsh? Yes. Petty? Yes. Tenant? Yes. An ordinance to rezone that property described in rezoning petition RZN 15-5254 for approximately seven and three quarter acres located north of 1016 South Washington Avenue from neighborhood conservation to RSF 18 residential single family 18 units per acre. Okay. And, I, and I think Jeremy, correct me if I'm wrong, but the, the fire codes would require uh, a subdivision with 70 homes or so to have at least two access points, right? That, that is correct, and we've been discussing with the applicant um, that proposal. Anything over 30 units, 30 residential homes actually, I think, requires a secondary point of access, and so that's something they're working on, uh, trying to provide with the proposal that they submit. Okay. Any final comments from the council on this? Good. Mayor, I'd just like to say that this is another reason that I love living in this city. We have a number of, uh, of citizens who've stepped forward to say we need some low-cost housing, and this is, uh, that's what we have. And I'm delighted that we're able to uh, provide this situation. Thank you, Della. <coughs> Mayor. Yes. I'll add my two cents. I'm delighted that we're getting some low-cost housing, but let me add, I'd like to see medium-cost housing and high-cost housing. I like markets that have varieties so people can pick and choose for themselves what they can afford, what they, can, what they like, what meets their needs the best. One size fits all seldom fits any. So congratulations on bringing more variety to our town. Thank you.
Okay. Anybody else? All right. Lisa, would you please call the roll? Schottmeyer? Yes. Latour? Yes. Gray? Yes. Marsh? Yes. Petty? Yes. Tennant? Yes. Okay, number five. An ordinance to amend 172.04 parking lot design standards to allow the curb radius for parking lot entrances to be based on an effective curb radius. Kit? Whereas modifying section 172.04 parking lot design standards to allow curb radius for parking lot entrances to be based on an effective radius rather than requiring an actual built radius would ensure functional vehicle turning movements while allowing more flexibility and customization in parking lot driveway design. Now, therefore, it be it ordained by the City Council of the City of Fayetteville, Arkansas, Section 1, that the City Council of the City of Fayetteville, Arkansas, hereby repeal Section 172.04-F3A-4 of the Fayetteville Code and enact a replacement Section 172.04-F3A-4 as follows. Effective curb radius, all driveway entrances serving eight or less parking spaces shall have a minimum effective curb radius of 10 feet and a maximum of 20 feet. Section 2, that the City Council of the City of Federal Arkansas hereby repeal Section 172.04-F4A-4 uh, of the Federal Code and enact replacement Section 172.04-F4A-4 as follows. Effective curb radius, all driveways serving nine or more parking spaces shall have an effective curb radius of 15 feet for curb cuts on local streets and effective curb radius of 20 feet for collector minor arterial and arterial streets. And section three, that the City Council of the City of Fayetteville, Arkansas hereby amends the tables located at the end of section 172.04 F3 and 172.04 F4 to change each occurrence of curb radiance to effective curb radius. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, it's a very simple ordinance. I think it uh, involves the addition of less than half a dozen words or so. Um, Sometime in the last year, we uh, made a major update to our minimum street standards. When we did that, we, re we relied on uh, guidance from uh, many groups, uh, but two in particular, the National Association of City Transportation Officials and the Institute for Transportation Engineers. And uh, one of the things we missed when we did the minimum street standards was uh, driveway and parking lot entrances. Uh, the minimum street standards technically only deal with street-on-street -street intersections. And so this was just a piece that got overlooked, and this ordinance would bring uh, those intersections into parity with the street standards that we have already adopted. That's good. That's good. Um, anybody got any questions on that? Yes. Uh, Matthew, I appreciate your comment. That's a very simple <coughs> ordinance, fewer than 12 words, but it sounded like more than 12 that Mr. Williams read. Uh, just a question, are we giving developers more authority to decide what's best for them, or are we <coughs> taking authority away from them saying, do it our way? Uh, more flexibility to developers. Okay. Well, that's the answer I was looking for, of course. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, any public comment on this? Okay, I'm going to bring it back to the council. We we'll go to the second reading. Second. second. Motion is second to go to the second reading. Lisa, would you please call the roll? Schottmeyer? Yes. Latour? Yes. Gray? Yes. Marsh? Yes. Petty? Yes. Tennant? Yes. In order to amend section 17204 parking lot design standards to allow the curb radius for parking lot entrances to be based on an effective curb radius. May we go to the third and final reading? Second. second. Motion is second to go to the third and final reading. Lisa, would you please call the roll? Schottmeyer? Yes. Mature? Yes. Gray? Yes. Marsh? Yes. Petty? Yes. Tennant? Yes. In order to amend section 17204 parking lot design standards to allow the curb radius for parking lot entrances to be based on an effective curb radius. Any final comments from the council? Thank you, Mayor. All right. Lisa, would you please call the roll? Schottmeyer? Yes. Mature? Yes. Gray? Yes. Marsh? Yes. Petty? Yes. Tennant? Yes. Okay, number six. A resolution to grant the appeal of a conditional of PPL 15-5253 to require the <laughs> developer to build a connection to Fox Trail. Now, you all have received a letter from um, the 
developer asking us to table this for two weeks to the next city council meeting. Everybody good? So yes, moved. Yes. All right, a motion is second to table. Second. A motion. Whoever. I move we table it. Second. Okay. <laughs> All right. They're fighting up there. Got to follow the rules. Right. <laughs> we'll table it for two weeks, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. All right. Lisa, would you please call the roll? Shot Meyer? Yes. Latour? Yes. Gray? Yes. Marsh? Yes. Eddie? Yes. In it? Yes. Okay. That concludes our business. What announcements do we have? There are a couple of <coughs> announcements. Uh, the city is currently accepting curbside Christmas trees, live Christmas trees that citizens need to dispose of. Uh, we're picking those up through the month of January. Or you can bring them to 1708 South Armstrong on Tuesday and Thursdays between 8 to 3 p.m. for no additional charge. The city is also uh, giving away mulch for free during the month of January. It's normally $10 per scoop. Uh, so if you need some mulch to uh, handle your muddy paths, this is a good time to get it because it's free. <laughs> Um, January 18th, all city offices that are open to the public will be closed for the Martin Luther, G Martin Luther King Jr. birthday holiday. Um, and also want to remind citizens who live um, in and around Hill Street and University Avenue that the railroad uh, is uh, closing those streets beginning tomorrow, um, one day each for the railroad crossing construction on South Hill. It will be closed from MLK to Stone Street, so you'll need to find a detour route for that. Um, close tomorrow from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. And then the following day on Thursday, the 7th, um, University Avenue, where there's another railroad crossing, will be closed from Putnam to South Gregg Avenue. So if you're in, in that area or live in that area, you need to plan for those um, detours while the railroad repairs the crossings. Okay. Anything else? Mayor, I'd like to thank our transportation department. Uh, we had an amazing amount of rain, and I expected flooding everywhere, and instead, except for my basement, I think we really didn't have much flooding in town. The streets, I think, remained open. The culverts were cleaned out by transportation division, and so I want to thank them for their hard work during the holiday season to keep us from flooding. Mm. Amen. Anything else? All right, thank you all. We're adjourned. <laughs>